video game bosses, much like my actual boss, are a real pain in the tuchus. You see, the joke is that um, I, I don't have a boss right now. Um, I'm actually my own boss, if anything. So that was just a little, a little reference I snuck in there, a little Easter egg, if you will. Um, and then I had to explain it because I'm not funny. At the end of my recent Halo video, I mentioned that I was kind of drained from its negativity. I don't love making negative stuff. And I promised that the next thing that I made would be more positive. And it was, it was a review about a game that I really, really liked. And, um, uh, now we're back to me being annoyed, I guess. But don't worry, as negative as this video could be because it revolves around one of my biggest video game annoyances, I actually want to take the time to explore when it's used well and how boss fights can improve in this regard going forward, as much as I want to dive into why I think the mechanic is self-destructive and lazy. In fact, I've actually decided to structure this a little bit differently today. Usually with these types of videos, I like to break the topic down into three individual sections that I'll discuss separately using one or two games as examples for those sections, and together they form my full opinion on that topic, but today I wanted to break this down by asking what's the problem, why is it a problem, when is it not a problem, and how can we fix the problem? That's right, I almost got the whole who, what, when, where, why, how squad pulling up, but I guess two of them were on sabbatical. Also, does anyone else always think of that weird Spy Kids song when they think of the five W's? What? When? I or is that just me? Anyways, with all of that preamble out of the way, um, I guess it's time to discuss one of my least favorite things in video games. Additional enemies in boss fights. Wait, is ad spelled with 1D or 2Ds? Okay, cool, it's 2D. What exactly is a video game boss supposed to do? It's a bit of a tough question to answer since, realistically, it could be any number of things. We've had bosses that are meant to make us feel a profound sense of guilt, or ones that make us feel relieved or elated, or even ones that have made us want to not win. It's a pretty broad spectrum. But I'd say that for the most part, especially from a gameplay standpoint, bosses are meant to test you, recontextualize a game's combat, introduce something entirely new to what you were doing normally, show just how far a potentially limited system can be stretched, or simply sell the idea of a foreboding presence. And I'd argue that almost all of that is lost when most of the difficulty, strategy, and player focus revolves around the smaller, inconsequential enemies that surround the main foe. The term adds refers to additional enemies during a boss and has often been associated with MMOs, a genre that I'm not very familiar with, but as you'll see, this has absolutely seeped into other genres, particularly first-person shooters, which I believe have the worst case of ads syndrome in the modern day. See games like Borderlands or Destiny along with some other examples that I explore in this video. I first became truly aware of just how annoying ads were in video games when I played Remnant from the Ashes with my brother a few years back. Overall, the game was enjoyable, unique, and a really fun co-op experience. I have a lot of good things to say about it, but we did find a glaring issue in its design that stuck in my head for years. Every single boss fight, without fail, we would begin to be swarmed by a barrage of smaller enemies that would nip at our heels and really take our attention away from the big bad of the room. The sheer amount of little gremlins that would follow us around was ludicrous. No, that's not- God, not this again. Stop, stop! No, I don't want it to just shut- Oh my god. Anyways, my brother and I created a system pretty early on where one of us would focus on the boss and one of us would focus on getting rid of the smaller enemies, especially ones that were near the designated boss shooter. It worked, although we had a lot of frustrating moments when we got on each other for not doing a good enough job with the surrounding enemies, but that just made us wonder, what would happen if we weren't playing co-op? This game is playable in single player, so just how bad would this additional enemy problem be if we weren't on our own? We never dared to try it, that sounds like a recipe for frustration, but I always remember thinking, that is a really lazy way to increase difficulty. I was reminded of my issue with this problem while playing Halo last week. I actually think Halo Infinite does a good job at avoiding this problem, a problem that a lot of other shooters have, and I'll touch on one thing that it does well in this regard later, but the first boss that shows up in this game featured a few side dishes alongside the main course, and although it only took me a few tries to beat this boss, I was acutely aware that the only reason I ever died or felt any semblance of challenge was because of the enemies that weren't even my main concern. Really, this boss was far less of an interesting gameplay change, which I think a boss needs to be, and was more of a big health bar in the midst of a bunch of smaller health bars all shooting at me, which isn't really unique or fun, it's just kind of irritating, which I guess leads me to... 
I've always seen boss fights as having specific concentrations and you really need to hit the right balance in order for them to be effective. The boss's attacks, design, arena, and lore need to fit one another. You can't have a fight with somebody like Ludwig pop out of nowhere never having heard of his name in a tiny room that can barely fit the two of you in it and then be left to fend for yourself. If this boss had the same look, same combo, same mid-fight cutscene mixed with an absence of atmosphere or a lack of buildup around him, it would have kind of sucked. That's like dumping 100 kilograms of Kool-Aid powder into a cup of water and expecting it to taste good because of the general idea that Kool-Aid in water equals good. You need to actually balance this boss with a room that reflects his madness. You need to hear about this guy throughout the whole story and build him up as this important figure in your head. Everything has to work together to create a perfectly concentrated boss fight. Similarly, if a boss is inconsequential, not important lore-wise, or intentionally not meant as a real threat, then just give them a small health bar, make their attacks pathetic, and let the player rip them apart. It doesn't make for a good boss fight necessarily, but it doesn't wind up diluting which should be something much more. Basically what I'm trying to say here is that just like chemistry, if you want an ideal concentration of something, the amount of solute needs to be matched with an even amount of solution. Bosses that rely on adds, however, have a much harder time balancing themselves because adding extra enemies for challenge and variety is such a crutch, such a quickly applied band-aid to a much deeper problem that either the balancing will feel disingenuous and lean towards unfair and frustrating, or the fights will seem empty, hollow, and forgettable. The Tower Knight and the One Reborn are not particularly difficult fights, there are far harder fights in both of these games, but they're some of the quickest ones to frustrate players if they do die a handful of times because a lot of these deaths will come from a nuisance that sniped you from off screen rather than the main thing that you're supposed to be fighting. Unless you trek around the outskirts and get rid of those people, which feels unnecessary. What's even worse though is that bosses in this framework tend to not only artificially increase the volume by adding in a bunch of extra enemies to deal with, but they also usually diminish the effectiveness of the boss for the sake of balance and to avoid frustration, since if the player had to deal with a bunch of enemies and a complicated boss, they're more likely to feel kind of slighted by the whole situation. The end result is that these fights are so watered down that you either entirely forget that they even existed, or you remember them as illegitimate boss fights that don't even deserve to hold that name because it's a blatant disservice service to the greats. Initially I was going to discuss Rom the Vacuous Spider as an example from Bloodborne that's kind of anti-podal to the well-constructed boss that is somebody like Ludwig, but for the sake of my fellow arachnophobes and for the sake of me editing this video, I say let's shift to another popular series, Batman Arkham, and discuss maybe the most watered down boss I can think of. Bane. The only remotely interesting part of this fight is trying to figure out how you're supposed to take Bane out. Like, not out on a date or something, out, as it out of life, how does Batman run him over with a Zamboni? And I use interesting very loosely here, mind you, it's pretty easy to figure out how to do this. Once you know you need to stun him while he's charging and then hit him in that state, the rest of the boss fight offers either nothing or annoyance. Take your pick, it depends on what difficulty you're playing on. The game lets you figure out the gimmick with just you and Bane, but once you get it, you're then met with a constantly replenishing supply of goons to fight while fighting Bane. It's just a stream of the exact same enemies that you encounter during the rest of Arkham Asylum, and they exist simply to serve as a distraction from the fact that Bane has exactly two moves, throw thing and run. That is the entirety of the moveset of this so-called boss. This is supposed to be some menacing creature that I'm scared of. <sighs> Wait, what the heck? How did that get back there? The Bane fight in Arkham Asylum can't even be classified as a boss fight in my opinion. It's far more in line with a normal enemy encounter with an environmental hazard. And once you hit that stage, I feel like you know you've diluted your enemy down way too far. I think you could also say the same thing about Kingpin early on in Spider-Man PS4. I like that at some points it does focus on just you and Fisky Boy, though mainly through quick time events. And I like everything around the boss fight, like the story and the dialogue associated with it. But I absolutely cannot act like this section where you're just fighting his boys as he wades around this massive sea of hired muscle is particularly enthralling. Every time a boss like this shows up surrounded by henchmen that do their dirty work as they throw in some lethargic jabs from a distance, I'm being shown that the developers have no confidence in their abilities and took the easy way out. And as a player, it always sucks that I was promised a boss fight, but I just got an irritant that was running around while I was dealing with the normal enemies that I was fighting throughout the rest of the game. A first-person shooter boss that has the same kind of problem 
problem in my opinion is the icon of sin from Doom Eternal. I swear the Doom games have shown up in like every single video in this series. I promise I play other games. This franchise just has a lot of things that I happen to be interested in. Now the thing is, a lot of people actually like this icon of sin section of the game and I'd be lying if I said I didn't like it as well. But notice how I said section and not boss, because I genuinely think the icon of sin boss element of this entire thing is the weakest part of it. The fun in this fight comes from being given the most overpowered weapons and skills and tearing through the humongous, usually problematic demons like their tissue paper. It's a fun arena to mess around in, absolutely, but the actual fight with the actual boss is just shooting a bunch of bullets into his massive, largely still frame one section at a time as he slams his fists around. In a weirdly paradoxical way, the ads were what made the fight fun, but they also took away from the actual boss. The final battle in this game is a big arena shootout, it's not really a boss fight, at least it doesn't feel like one. The encounter is more memorable for the things outside of the boss than it is for the boss itself, so as a whole, it's good, as a boss fight, it's bad. And you could frankly remove the Icon of Sin from this whole scenario, and you'd still be left with most of what makes this section fun. I actually had an idea while making this video of what could have made a cooler Icon of Sin boss fight, but we'll get to that eventually. For now, I think we should hone in on the idea of these ads actually being beneficial and discuss when I think this mechanic historically hasn't been all that terrible. While this isn't my favorite trick in the book, and I still ultimately think it sticks out as a crutch more than an inspired choice, I'm partial to boss fights that use additional enemies as almost an interlude between their more bossy moments. These fights are usually not the best, and they're definitely very overplayed at this point, but it's still a little bit more digestible because while the boss might lack variety, at least they're not so boring that they need a distraction at all times in order for the player to feel engaged. To take examples from the same franchises that I mentioned earlier, the fights against Mr. Negative and Raj al Ghul are ones that that show at least a little effort and showcase more one-on-one -on -one sections. With the normal enemies feeling like a way to pace out the fight, sure, pad out the time that the fight lasts, absolutely, but not necessarily feeling like an obvious smoke and mirrors illusion to hide a poorly thought out and designed boss. Those fights also feature enemies that are able to be killed in one hit within a combat system that usually requires a bit more pummeling to defeat the enemies in regular combat, and even games like Hellblade have taken that to a degree. This is another twist on ads that I think has the potential, at least, to be a bit more enjoyable than it is is a hindrance. It allows the player to fly around like a maniac in between raining hell on a boss, which feels like the mechanic being a bit more self-aware about the fact that these additional entities are a padding of sorts, and it lets you swat them away like flies as you're honed in to the main threats. Again, it's not my preferred type of fight, but it's far less of a nuisance, and I think it could be molded to suit a story where the main character just goes sicko mode for a minute. Like, could you imagine in Spider-Man 2, Kraven's fighting black suit Spidey and is just getting rattled, absolutely bounced around, and then he tries to to send out some dudes to help him out, but Spider-Man's just one hit KOing everyone and going back to bashing Kraven's face in between all of that? Dude, that would be insane, and it just goes to show that if this mechanic was actually used for a purpose instead of just used as a backup, it could be made great. The best thing though is when the game can turn these irritating enemies into helpful parts of the boss, like once again bringing up a game from the last section, Doom Eternal with the Marauder and the Gladiator. I know some people have a problem with the Marauder, but that's generally more to do with how they show up out and about during normal combat. Combat, there's less vitriol around the boss fight version. While both of these bosses still feature adds, those enemies are more there to serve the player, even if they can still deal damage, since the enemies in Doom are capable of being a source of health through the glory kill mechanic. This means that there's no point during the fight where you feel like you have no chance, where you're at 1 HP and have no health options. In this case, the additional enemies are a way to save yourself, and that's in my opinion one of the only ways I've ever seen this mechanic used well in a game. It's not just okay like the other two things I mentioned, it's genuinely good. And with all of that out of the way now, I think we can have a better discussion about how games can either avoid this problem altogether, or at the very least, mitigate its adverse effects. <laughs> In my aggressive healing video, I talked about how a lot of shooters, the same ones that are more likely to feature bosses in the first place, are getting more mobile and implementing offensive strategies for healing. And I think that any game that includes a system like that needs to, one, only use extra enemies in service of allowing that system to exist during that boss fight, and two, show more confidence in letting the boss be as mobile as the player. In that same video I just referenced, I noted how Ultra Kill did this. That game lets you heal through the blood of your enemies. It sounds demonic every time I try to describe 
describe it. But basically that means that you can have a boss that's jumping and sliding and dashing around like a lunatic doing crazy damage to you, but you're still gonna be okay because if you can place a well-timed shotgun blast directly to their dome piece, all of a sudden you go from being on the brink of death to having all of your health back. If you're gonna put aggressive means of healing into your game, and if you're gonna give the player the ability to grapple or dash or slide, allow the enemy to match that movement. You can have a tough boss that tests the player's skill without the need for multitasking. It's also not a bad idea for shooters to introduce a new idea that's solely used in boss fights. I love the fact that the same two fights that I mentioned before from Doom all of a sudden allow you to parry with your gun. That's not something you can do outside of the Marauder and the Gladiator, but it's okay to change your rules a little as long as you're using the same basic tools as before. Not everything needs to be a chunky health bar that hits hard but mainly stands still for you to shoot at for 10 minutes. On top of that, I think it's imperative to implement more boss arenas that let you use your game's unique movement tools. Basically let the setting add layers to the fight instead of adding more enemies. Or if you're insistent on adding more enemies, use them in a way to set a grand stage but let them be dealt with in flashy, unique ways. Like incorporating more environmental takedowns in Arkham style games inside of big boss arenas. Let smaller enemies become part of a set piece but not necessarily part of a fight. After that first boss of Halo Infinite, you start mainly fighting the big bads one on one and the real X factor here is the arena and how you can use it for cover or for creative attacks. You can use the grapple to escape or get good positioning on your opponent and it would have been even cooler if the arenas were a bit more of a jungle gym, really allowing you to pull off more than some basic maneuvers, but even as it was, it was pretty fun to do this. All in all, I feel like there's so many ways to push boss design forward in genres where they've been really uninspired recently, but instead we're always saddled with this, ah, this boss fight isn't too interesting so let's throw a lot of random stuff at the player and hope they don't notice. You want the icon of sin to be this giant imposing force, but you also don't want the player to be looking at its feet the whole time and be a big bullet sponge? Cool. Instead of giving me an endless supply of fodder enemies, put more focus on the interesting movement that you developed for this game. Imagine if the Icon of Sin induced a tornado around himself, not only creating a cool arena for the fight, but sending things like grapple points and monkey bars and launch pads spinning around him. And the fight contained the same idea as before, you shoot off all the different parts of his armor and then his body, but this time you had to use all of these pieces to get up to his head, use your momentum to shoot yourself upwards with a grapple point and unload your rocket launcher into the dude, swing onto a launch pad and then have it send you back up. Imagine you're on the ground and there's this big slam attack coming and it's got this huge damage cone that you're not gonna be able to dash away from, but then you spot a little grapple point between his wickets and you latch onto it and you fly through his legs and he slams down and you turn around and shoot him in the back. A giant boss doesn't necessarily mean a big, hunky, boring one. There's ways to make these things interesting, you just have to be a bit more creative. I'm well aware that I have no clue how to really develop a game or how much time it takes to implement stuff like that. I am in no way acting like I'm smarter than the people that made that game or any of these games for that matter, nor do I know if that icon idea that I just pitched is even possible. But I feel like sometimes the people making these games settle for a tried and true method that frankly most people don't enjoy instead of trying to solve the problem more creatively. We've seen examples of games in every genre that decide to take more creative routes and it leads to better results. Ultra Kill is an indie game with intentionally dated graphics wherein most of the bosses don't look imposing or sometimes even all that interesting. And yet it's got some of the best bosses I've ever experienced in a first person shooter. It has a fight that reminds me of the Icon of Sin that I like better as a boss fight than the actual Icon of Sin fight. There's a lot of potential in games that I feel like it's abandoned for the sake of convenience and I hope that in the future more development teams will recognize this and strive to create more interesting solutions to familiar problems. Subscribe if you're new to the channel, uh, like the video if you enjoyed, and I'll see you guys next time. Peace. Since the enemies in Doom are capable of being a source of health through the glory hole. <laughs> That's a glory hole mechanic.